Dr. Robert Plana, thank you so much for having me here at A System headquarters in Paris. Okay, you're welcome. Yeah, you're Chief Technology Officer, mm -hmm. but before we get into your role here, I just want to know a little bit about your background, where you grew up, and how you got in the nuclear space. So, um, I am French, and um, I grew up in the south of France, Toulouse, graduate at the university with a, a PhD uh, a graduate. A PhD? Uh, Why a PhD? <laughs> it's, a, it's a lot of work. Uh, actually, it was it was very interesting because when I was a student, uh, I was more fascinated by sports. Hmm. And then at the end of my courses, I discover research domain, uh, and I I found that so fascinating. And yeah. I said, okay, this is that I want to do. What were you doing research in that was so fascinating? Uh, I think. Because, you know, every day you have to discover uh, new uh, things. Mm -hmm. uh, you have a lot of autonomy and you have a complex problem to solve. I remember my first uh, PhD uh, uh, topic, I was not understanding at all what, what I was <laughs> having to do. <laughs> um, so it was very uncomfortable, but it's... It's very interesting because it's, it's, it's good for the mindset. Yeah. It develops a specific mindset where you're, you're never scared and then you dare to, to do just amazing things. Yeah, most people would run, I think, if after the first year they were lost like that, yeah. but you went into it. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it was interesting because after six months, I, I went to my supervisor with a, a short note. Well, it was 20 pages. Explain, 20 pages, yeah, which 20 is a pages. short note. <laughs> yeah, explaining, explaining him that I will stop my PhD because what he asked for is impossible to, uh, to, uh, to be done. Wow, that's and, bold. And, and then the 20 pages was explaining the reason. <laughs> and uh, the supervisor took the weekend and then came back on Monday, uh, asked me to, 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 to visit him in his office. It was very formal. And um, he told me, I'm not completely agree with you, but tell me what you want to do. So I stopped the initial topics mm -hmm. and I chose another one and where I was more comfortable. And then that was the start of my PhD. Amazing. <laughs> That's You made somebody read a 20-page paper about why they're wrong and yeah. you're right and... You should, they should let you yeah. do what you want to do. Yeah. But you know, it built, it built also the mindset. That means yeah. uh, never give up. And if you, if you refuse to, uh, to do something, you have to argue and then you have to explain. Yeah. And then find an alternative solution. And this is exactly what you have to do uh, in a professional life. Yeah. Sometimes you have a roadblock, never give up, try to find an alternative route. I think this is what we need in the nuclear industry. Yeah, because <laughs> nuclear industry is a very complex industry. Yeah. And uh, by essence, because the projects are huge and there is um, a lot of interfaces. You know, uh, there is construction, there is equipment, there is people. And, uh, and this is a very long process. You mm -hmm. know, it takes five years for the design. Another five years for construction and a uh, couple of years for commissioning and then 40 years, 50 years exploitation and then you have the dismantling. Right. So you can have a project on the um, uh, 100 years range. Right. And you know, many things can happen in 100 years. Yeah. And, and you have to make sure that the memory of the project uh, uh, will, uh, will be there every time. Right. And uh, so experts are essential. But when experts disappeared or they change jobs, or you have to find a solution to, to retrieve uh, the memory of the project, the right. knowledge, et cetera, et cetera. So... Um, yeah, so th this is um, very, very interesting and, and again, fascinating uh, 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 domain. 
Yeah, but you didn't start out strictly in nuclear, right? You studied no. physics. Yeah, I I I studied many things, and uh, I I studied physics and um, and then some uh, electronics because because okay that was uh, I was interested by that, and then I've done some uh, design of circuits hmm. for communication. Okay. And then I've, I've done some uh, mechanical uh, um, studies for um, miniaturized accelerometer sensors and stuff like that, like that. And then I spent a lot of time in electromagnetism. And, um, and I finished my uh, research or career uh, by working in uh, Internet of Things uh, domain. It was a long time ago already, 2005 <laughs> or 2006. I set up a lab in uh, Internet of Things. Um, and then these topics will also be present in nuclear, and then we, we can talk of that later on. Yeah, of course. absolutely. And, uh, so, um, so, you know, even if I have done many things, I think that uh, everything is, is driven by... Uh, the, the the scientific aspect and the innovation and uh, the way to um, solve uh, uh, problems. So that's. Uh, so do you think that your interest in technology and innovation and solving problems did that come from your family? Are they engineers or scientists, or did uh, it just click for you? Yeah, I think my my my, my grandfather was driver uh, at SNCF, which is uh, the railway operator, so nothing uh -huh. to do with that. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> my, other, my, uh, my other grandfather was commercial. He was a salesman for retail. Which he passed a little bit on to you, I'm yeah, sure. Yeah, perhaps, yeah. <laughs> and um, and uh, my father was a uh, professor of physics. There we go. Yeah. So <laughs> I think I have some genes. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Maybe a little bit of persuasion throughout your yeah. childhood. Uh, yeah. <laughs> and um, uh, it was very interesting because I started to be a university professor, but very rapidly I found that very boring. <laughs> yeah. uh, because it was all the, all the time the same things. Right. Research uh, is more yeah. interesting because, but teaching is a little bit boring because... You have to follow a program, yeah. And the the part of innovation in a program is very is very small. And then you have you have to do every year the same same uh, same program, right? So you can just make some theater and uh, <laughs> play the actors and then present the things in a different way, in a much fancy way. But okay, it's rapidly boring. Yeah, it's pretty funny because it's something I think about often is how, as a student, it's the first time you're ever hearing this. You're like, wow, this is amazing. When the teacher is like teaching this three times a week, yeah. five years in a row. Yeah. <laughs> it's so boring. <laughs> yeah. it's, a, it's a bit tough. <laughs> but it seems like now your role is the complete opposite, where you're probably always looking at a lot of new ideas and a lot of different innovations. Yeah. And, and my role is also... Um, to um, to detect uh, the talent in the company and the ideas, and to make sure that uh, I will uh, uh, integrate the talent and the ideas to uh, leverage the business. Right. Because mm -hmm. my vision of the innovation is, we don't have to innovate for innovate. We innovation is when you transform an idea into business. Mm -hmm. And that's very important because if you innovate uh, for innovate without transforming to business, this is R and D, right? Where the, uh, the the success rate is extremely low, but this is the this is uh, the the minds the essence of the R and D. Uh, you have a lot of project failing, and then some uh, are succeeding. And uh, but in a service company. We don't have to do R&D. We don't have time and even uh, money. Mm -hmm. So we have to focus on innovation very rapidly, uh, transforming into uh, being transformed into uh, into business. Yeah. Uh, and this is my role. 
try to make sure that uh, I identified the right ideas, the right people, and put the right process to create the business. Yeah, it sounds um, simple, but yeah. it's a tough job, I'm sure. I think it's a very interesting job. I'm quite busy. And, uh, my door is all, always open because I need to, uh, to have um, everybody uh, um, uh, accessible. And, uh, you know, so people ask, ask me some, for support and uh, they want to talk to me to, to the problem they are facing. Uh, in their daily uh, uh, jobs with the customers. Uh, and then I use all these uh, um, requests, needs, to build my uh, innovation roadmap. And, um, and of course, this uh, roadmap is, uh, is shared with the uh, with, um, uh, executive committee. And then we, we are deciding where we are investing, and uh, and where well, we are not investing, and um, I, I I can elaborate a little bit more the the process I I, I, I set up concerning the the innovation governance because th for me this is very important yeah. because if you don't have an appropriate innovation governance you're losing money you're losing time mm -hmm. uh, because you're 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 developing ideas without any uh, business opportunities behind. Right. And um, usually in a conventional company, they use a, they use a scale that is called the uh, um, technology readiness level scale. Mm -hmm. This has been invent invented by NASA. Okay. So the, the, this uh, TRL scale uh, starts with one to nine. One, this is fundamental research. Nine is product. Okay. And, uh, Why not 10? Why does it go to nine? Because ask the NASA engineers. <laughs> <laughs> you know, this is like the Richter scale, yeah. you know, for earthquake. <laughs> <laughs> so, uh, and, uh, for, and then you have some range, some, some slots. One, three, this is research. Three, Six, this is demonstrator. Six, nine, product. Mm -hmm. Pre-development and development. Yeah. And that's a very important scale. And then for services company, I introduce a new scale, mm -hmm. which is called business readiness level scale, which is very important. Again, I took BRL one to nine. Mm -hmm. <laughs> one business is not existing. We have identified right. the needs, but nothing is. Three, five, we still have some, uh, some business existing. The, co the competitors are not well identified. The actors are not, the, 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 uh, the, the actors are not very well structured. The market is not very consolidated, uh, still hesitating, which route. Uh, right. And then six to nine, market very mature and um, and when we are addressing the different ideas we are comp we are balancing between the trl and the brl mm -hmm. and this is with the, these two criteria we are deciding which project we will support or not so that's very important because if a service a services company is not a product company so the trl is not the most important criteria. BRL is important. Right. And on the portfolio of innovation, I, I choose to have 75% BRL 6 to 9. Mm -hmm. uh, let's say 15% is 5 to 6. And the rest, very sh small percentage with the low BRL because yeah. this is anticipation. Right. It's more risky, but we need also to anticipate a little bit. Does sort of your cost and investment of time equate equally to those different sections where you put most of your cost and your time into the business-ready models? Yeah, of course, of course. Yeah. The, 
the 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 most uh, the mo the the largest part of the investment this is uh, allocated in the BRL uh, uh, six to nine because this is where we will generate the business rapidly. Mm -hmm. You know, this is uh, quick sugar. <laughs> so we have to burn very rapidly uh, the energy because yeah. this is our business model. And what's in that category right now? So for, for instance, uh, um, um, we have, uh, when, we, when we are using the, the, the building information modeling uh, services, mm -hmm. This the market is very structured, so we are developing uh, additional services to improve uh, the beam uh, uh, the, the the beam services to introduce new functionality. For instance, uh, this functionality can be clash detection, can be uh, um, um, cost estimation, etc. Uh, because this is one point we, we didn't mention before, but in the nuclear business, you have uh, potentially a lot of data. Mm -hmm. And uh, I think probably 10, 10 to 5 to 10 years ago, it was not possible to... Um, to, uh, to have all these data uh, accessible. So now we, we are, the technology are ready to move from the documents to data. So we are able to have all the data available. And from all this data, it creates new service opportunities. So are you saying that because we started recording the data not on paper and yes. books, yeah. but electronically, now we're yeah. able to manipulate it easier? Yeah. Do we still use the data from the books and we've just put it into the computer? Oh yeah, of course. We are we are scanning a lot of we are scanning a lot of document. We are using uh, the last technology of optical character recognition together with artificial intelligence to transform the. Uh, the 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 image mm -hmm. into text. Oh, okay, great. <laughs> uh, yeah, it works well. Yeah. It works well, and uh, we are using uh, we are using some 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 technology that that has been that have, has been developed by Google by Facebook. This is open source uh, algorithms for artificial intelligence because they have a lot of data. They have scanned a lot of documents. Google, Facebook, mm -hmm. and. Um, uh, and their their algorithms are very efficient, and and we are using these algorithms. We are adapting these algorithms for uh, nuclear industry. Yeah. And uh, so we are able to when the documents are in box, we we are scanning the document. The only difficulties we have is when the documents are handwritten. Mm. This is very difficult. Yeah. When they are typewritten easy to read or to transform into text. When they are handwritten, this is more difficult and there is there is more errors. Is that and when you hire an intern yeah. and have them type it all up? <laughs> Not only one. <laughs> <laughs> no, I think that, um, you know, we have to accept that when we are scanning a document, there will be some errors. Mm -hmm. And then uh, we have to live with that because this is still more efficient than uh, having people reading the documents uh, manually. Right. Because they, the, the way they are, uh, uh, the mindset is influencing the way they read, the way they are interpret, and uh, the way they will uh, rewrite or understand. Uh, because sometimes in the documents where there is a lot of information uh, contained in the documents, but the problem is these documents have been written by uh, many peoples with many semantic uh, uh, style. Hmm. So when you read a document written by many hands, the the your perception is is completely different, and then it's right. difficult because uh, the way I'm writing is different the way you're writing, the, the way uh, Jill is is writing, and then if there is another person reading, he said, "Hmm, 
what what did she say what the what, what did he write you know the the Right. The interpretation, the interpretation. is, uh, yeah. and then there is a lot of misinterpretation, hmm. and for nuclear, that creates a lot of reworking activities. Right, and the machine, and artificial intelligence, will be able to uh, get rid of that. Ah, very That's cool. very important yeah. because the the machine is not a human. Right. So, and if you configure the machine in a proper manner, you will. Eliminate the semantic noise. And when we're talking about. The style about... It can be assimilated to semantic noise. Yeah. When um, you're talking about the interpretation of these documents, are these documents what operators were recording, say, accidents on? And they're, you know, describing what happens when the plant does this and how did we fix it? Or what are these documents describing? There, there, there is a different type of document. That's a good point. Um, Let's start with um, the engineering documents, where your first category of documents, they are describing the requirements mm. specification. For how to run the plant. Yeah, for how to, not how to design. Oh, how to design the plant. How to design, because you, you need, uh, you, uh, there, is, there is some uh, strict requirements concerning the safety, the security, yeah. uh, the type of uh, function we have to, um, uh, to, uh, to run. Um, and that's the first point that is difficult to, to isolate. The, the quality of the requirements and, uh, um, and the way you will extract the requirements will determine your functional architectures, and then your logical architecture, and then your physical architectures. Right. So if you misinterpret something, you will have an error propagation up to the physical uh, architectures. And then the engineer said, no, 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 this is not the appropriate way. And then we have to, to restart at the beginning. Right. So the idea is to have a machine reading these documents in a, in a proper manner, extracting the requirements, and then having the functional architectures, logical architectures, and physical architectures um, uh, done in a, in a more uh, robust and efficient way. That's the first point. Second point, what, what, you, what you refer to is inspection report. So, and this is very important in nuclear because we have a lot of inspection. There is uh, regular inspection, there is an uh, outage uh, uh, period where there is a lot of works done, etc. Et um, as this domain is very um, heavily regulated, mm -hmm. the inspection reports are very well structured. Yeah. And there is a lot of information, very rich information. So the so the the, the people uh, they inspect some asset or group of asset or zone, and then they they they, they mention uh, some uh, uh, malfunction, some uh, um, some damage, etc. Cetera, etc. Cetera, and then they note. Mm -hmm. And uh, and what is interesting is reading all this. Uh, inspection reports, uh, we are able to determine what is called some uh, hot mapping. I mean, mm -hmm. we can be able, it's like uh, the profiling uh, concept. When you, when you do some, some shopping, Amazon, or mm -hmm. they are detecting the different uh, uh, items you're, you looked at, and then they are proposing similar. Yeah, making little and th predictions. Yeah. yeah, and this is exactly what we are doing for reading when we read the uh, inspection report or incident report, and we are isolating some uh, some clusters, yeah. some uh, classification, and then we said, oh, this pump is very often uh, failing. This zone has been. Uh, um, 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 uh, having problems many times for the last uh, 10 years, for instance. So this is classified as a sensitive area. Right. 
this group of assets is very critical because we uh, we observe uh, already um, 25 incidents, and these 25 incidents have been related to uh, um, uh, 100 days of, uh, 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 op of um, uh, non-operation of the of the nuclear power plant, and then we are losing money. And then once you have identified this um, critical asset, mm -hmm. you know what you have to take care of first. You have the, the, right. the, you know, the zone where you have to focus. That's very important uh, because, you know, the, we, with the, the very huge uh, nuclear power plant, mm -hmm. if you have the map where are the critical assets, you, you can focus and then you can optimize your maintenance activities or your outage uh, activities first. Second, you can get some models of the asset and for the future project, you will pay more attention designing uh, the new system mm -hmm. accordingly. So designing to prevent the yeah. problem. Design for predictive, design for testability, et cetera, et cetera. So I call that design for X. That means you use the uh, return of on experience and the results of previous project mm -hmm. to update the design of the future project. Yeah. And this is, for instance, this is why a company like Asystem being involved for 50 years in nuclear, there is a lot of memory. And then we are... We want to model this memory to make sure that for the future project, we will introduce uh, uh, our memory at the design phase. Right. And then doing that, we expect to uh, to uh, to have the the, the project uh, more efficient operation uh, uh, in um, with uh, with a better. Uh, uh, efficiency, etc. So what are some of the biggest, maybe it's a design or a construction or a planning flaw that you guys have been able to pull out from all this old data that's like a huge cost or time saver? I think that uh, uh, to, today we there is one uh, one project is a, is a waste management uh, infrastructures. We are just finishing to uh, to uh, to commission to test and commission and um, we used to do this project we used uh, 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 first a beam approach a data approach and then that has been used to build uh, the beam and the digital twin of the infrastructures and then we are using the expertise of uh, our engineers to do the commissioning uh, um, uh, in a with the digital uh, tools. We, using the digital technology, we expect to save 20% for the, during the design phase. Wow, that's and a big between, saving. Yeah, and between 10 to 20% for the operation. On top of the design, so you're, you know, 30 to 40% cost savings. Yeah. Across the yeah. project. Across the project, yeah, yes. That's yes. amazing. Yeah. And then this is very important because today everybody is saying that we don't have enough engineers to cover all the project. Mm. So if we want to do more project, yeah. we have to do uh, we have to use less engineers per project. Mm. You know, it's not only a question of uh, cost saving, it's also a, a question of uh, resources optimization and uh, in front of us there is a lot of nuclear project yeah and uh, and we have a scarcity of the resources hmm. so, even when you pull from you know international oh, yeah, of course. teams of engineers there's just not enough engineers not enough what kind of engineers do we need uh, we need we need different type of engineers we of for, for nuclear uh, okay. They need they need to know a little bit uh, the nuclear industry and the nuclear processes, but we need uh, mechanical engineers, electrical engineers, uh, and uh, also um, ventilation uh, engineers. 
we also need some um, more and more people and uh, specialists uh, uh, on data management, mm. data architectures. Uh, we also need some uh, system engineers to do the system engineering. So we need architect uh, that will be able to uh, to manipulate the functional requirements and to design the 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 infrastructures in a, in a proper in a proper manner. So our um, our scope of competencies is w rather uh, large. Yeah, and um, and uh, that and that's also very interesting for young engineers because when you start on one position in a system he can do a very uh, diverse journey. Yeah. Um, he can move from one position to different position. He can, he can start uh, design, designing some uh, special machi machine in, uh, in Sunderland and UK, mm -hmm. and then move to France to, uh, to work on the Flamanville uh, uh, European pressure reactors, and then move to ITER project, and then later on, move to uh, um, um, uh, a siting or licensing project in the Middle East, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. So for young engineers, I think this this is um, this is an exciting company because uh, we are covering a very very large uh, uh, scope of competencies, and then you can learn and uh, at 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 uh, every project. Yeah, absolutely. And just speaking of projects, what are you know some of the most interesting projects that you've gotten to work on here as chief technology officer? Yeah, the, uh, today uh, we we have a different project, and uh, um, we have worked on the new type of, um, for instance, um, a modular reactor, which is called small modular reactors, very popular in Canada, United States, and uh, this is a nuclear power plant with medium size. Right. But we are using uh, uh, we are using a, a new technology to have the architectures uh, designed in a more modular way that you can accelerate uh, the design phase and then the construction phase. Mm -hmm. There's many things can be done in a, at a, at a factory site, and then uh, on the site project you do, you you do more assembly. And uh, so that's one uh, one point. Uh, so SMR project, we uh, we uh, we we uh, we started uh, uh, in 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 co-development with the uh, Rolls Royce in UK, and we st we we have an R and D project, innovation project on that. There is another very important project for us, which is a hot cells project. Hot cells. Hot cells, because when you're in um, in a nuclear environment, there is there is a lot of uh, zone where there is uh, radiation, mm -hmm. and uh, and of course, uh, this radiation are in a box which is called hold hot cell. Hot cell. Okay. Yeah. Why is very... the radiation in a box? What do you mean? Because to uh, to protect the environment. I see. So uh, it's yeah. like the containment. Yeah, yeah. This is okay. uh, yeah. yeah, and uh, so this is yeah. This is called hot cell, and this is where you're manipula manipulating uh, some irradiating uh, irradiated uh, uh, materials, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. And you have to design the hot cells in a in a in a proper manner to respect the safety requirements, to respect the environment requirements, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. Mm -hmm. And uh, an hot cell can be small, but also can be very big. And uh, um, for ITER project, uh, we are working on a very big hot cell. And this is for the fusion machine. Yeah. In, yeah. yeah. And uh, there is another project uh, which is called uh, Machine Vision, and uh, this is a project aiming to uh, uh, to do um, um, advanced inspection for nuclear uh, materials, mm. graphite reactors or whatever. So when you when you when you want to do the uh, the this reactor inspection. Uh, 
of course, this is in a very uh, harsh environment. It's not easy to, uh, it's impossible to go. To get to, right. To get to first. Um, and second, uh, you have to be able to identify very teeny cracks mm. or, or even some uh, very small uh, uh, defects. That you can't really see with your eye, oh, per no, se? No, no, no. You need to have a sort of uh, microscope, mm -hmm. but with uh, uh, working in a, a radiation, radiative environment. So we have developed a, a, a project which is called Machine Vision. Uh, mm -hmm. So it's, um, it, it's, it's a combination of uh, uh, advanced camera and a laser, uh, uh, la laser system and appropriate or sophisticated uh, data processing to be able to detect cracks uh, uh, with a resolution better than 50, mic 50 micron. Wow. So one micron, this is a diameter of your hair. Right. 50 micron. That's crazy. Yeah. So we are able to detect um, the, the, the crack of this dimension. So and do uh, cracks of that dimension really matter? Oh yeah, of course, because what is important is to detect the cracks as soon as possible, mm -hmm. because after that they propagate and then get, get getting bigger and bigger. Right. And what is also important is to identify the physics of crack, why uh -huh. why it 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 has been uh, generated. Mm -hmm. uh, most of the time, it, it could be uh, accelerated with, through through uh, radiation. Can be also uh, um, accelerated because there is a gradient of stress, or because the the, the, the reactor has not been designed properly, whatever. Um, and of course, we have to make sure that uh, we are following, monitoring uh, carefully the evolution of the the size of the cracks, because there is uh, after a certain size, we have to stop the reactors. Right to uh, maintain it or to change or, or and this is this is a big project in UK today uh, the uh, analysis of the of, of the crack for graphite reactors What's and we are we are we are mixing uh, some uh, new machine vision uh, inspection with the modeling and the artificial intelligence to retrieve and to uh, identify the physics of cracks. So, okay, so a few questions on oh, that because yeah, it's a really interesting topic. Um, the first would be, is this so important, especially in nuclear, because the materials that we're looking at for the cracks are irradiated? So to replace them, it would be so much more costly because you have to shut the whole plant down and be really careful about the replacement versus like, you know, if you're just in a water treatment plant and the cement cracks a little bit, it's not really a huge deal. I think the, the, main, the main issue, this is a safety issue. Mm -hmm. Because if we have something unexplained, the, the, the safety authorities, they will not accept that. Hmm. So it's a safety issue because of the yeah, regulator oh, yeah, says it's an issue, but it's not necessarily presenting a hazard. I think that we never know, and mm -hmm. and you know, as soon as we don't have very exhaustive explanation of the origin of the cracks and the speed they will propagate, we have to monitor. Yeah, so you know, very low risk, taking no risk. We have to basically. no risk, and this is this is in the in the requirement for the the safety authority authority, authority sorry. Yeah. And but that's very important, and uh, and you know the graphite material is a very complex materials, and because there is a lot of foils, mm -hmm. and. Uh, the the physics of the the physics of interaction between the different foils is very complicated right. because this is um, interface uh, and surface effect 
which is the most difficult properties to uh, model and to, uh, to, uh, to explain in physics. The volume, we are succeeding to explain when there is some uh, volume uh, uh, um, um, properties or, 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 or effects. Surface effect, this is very difficult. Right. Because sometimes the surface properties is very randomly distributed. Mm. And the, the, the surface energy are not very well uh, understood. And then if the surface uh, uh, energy are not very well understood, that means the interaction will not be uh, very well understood. And then we have to monitor, to check. And then we are, we are mixing the, the knowledge of today with the model we have, mm -hmm. with the new data coming from the machine vision. And then we are enriching the model. We are, and then this is a digital twin concept. Yeah. And, uh, yeah. And, uh, and this is crucial because, you know, um, otherwise at, at one time, the, the safety authority, we said, okay, we stop all the reactors. Mm -hmm. Even if nothing will happen, but right. we don't have, we don't want to take the risk. And okay, that's, that's normal. Right. You know, this is uh, this is uh, this this is a requirement, and this is what we have to um, to um, to live with with the nuclear uh, industry. Right now, what is the requirement? Like, what's an acceptable size crack size? I think that when when it starts to be a couple of centimeters, it's not acceptable. Okay, yeah. yeah. So you can see it with your eyes yeah. clearly. Yeah, yeah, of course. And of then course. how long does it usually take to, you know, replace if there is a crack of that size? Oh, it's many, many months. Many months. Because you have to shut everything down. Oh, yeah. yeah. And get special people in there to replace it. Oh, yeah, of course. of course. And then after that, you have to 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 commission the reactors again, et cetera, et cetera. There is, it's a long process. Yeah. So it's your strategy process. of preventing it in the first place yeah. using uh, the model is is spot on for cost savings. That will be uh, that will be huge. So where is it? Where is the model right now as it stands? Is it predicting anything at this point? Even I think for the there there is two two two. Uh, Two uh, two points on your on your question. The first yeah. is machine vision. To, today is TRL five. We have first demonstrator. We are still improving the resolution of the of the system. And then for the second part, uh, with the, the the data and the understanding of the uh, where we are and the the properties, I would say that. Probably, we still need uh, at least a couple of years of R and D to understand properly where we are. And Is that uh, because we need more data to feed? We into need the more model? data, and then it's that th we also need to incorporate the knowledge of the expert, mm -hmm. and then we are developing some model originating from the ex from the knowledge of the expert. We are embarking a lot of simulation, that are finite element model simulations, and et cetera. And uh, so it takes time. It takes time. This is a very, very, diff very complicated uh, problem. And uh, but very exciting also. Very yeah. exciting. Uh, it develops for engineers, it develops a lot of knowledge. And, and this knowledge could be used for other uh, projects because the way you manipulate the data, the way you are creating some digital twin, the way you are using artificial intelligence to try to identify some pattern, sorry, etc., is is knowledge that you that you can reuse uh, on other uh, domain. And mm -hmm. for us, that's important. And this is why we are we are also investing in this uh, in this project. And uh, of course, the customers they they are they are looking to have the result for for yesterday, but we'll try, we'll try for tomorrow. Right. <laughs> <laughs> it's just because they're excited. <laughs> we are we are we are trying to do our best. We yeah. are trying to do our best.
So uh, there is um, there is one uh, one project which is called uh, predictive maintenance. So predictive maintenance, this is a graal of all the industry. Everybody wants to uh, to have the predictive maintenance mm-hmm. uh, system implemented uh, in this uh, infrastructures, but this is very difficult. <laughs> So what is it exactly? So predictive maintenance is you you are able to predict the lifetime of your system, machine or group of machine, mm-hmm. and before the before the machine failing, you are uh, you are doing the maintenance uh, when it is needed, mm. because today, for instance, for cars. We do preventive maintenance. Mm-hmm. Preventive is every twenty thousand kilometers, I change this joint, I change the oil, uh, right. check the the tire. Even the if the there's tide. no problem, if, I change if, it anyways. Yeah, yeah. yeah, even first point. Even if there is no issues, they change or they check. Mm-hmm. It completely uh, f- uh, ignore. The, what is called the health index of your cars or of your asset. Mm-hmm. For instance, a car that, that is used in city is not aging in the same way than in a country. Right. A car that is used in a sea uh, weather is not aging the same way than in a, in a, in, in a in a, in in a, in another climate where there is no sea and no humidity right you know because there is no rest or etc cetera, etc cetera. and this is the same for the machine so now by using the data using new sensor we are trying to develop the health index of the machine that is the property of the machine under the operative condition mm mm-hmm. And then once we have the health index, we are able to calculate what is called the mean time before failure or the mean time to failure. Mm-hmm. And then we uh, we have a sort of uh, 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 KPI, and then we are following. So KPI? it is KPI. It's a key performance indicator. And so now you you can see you have a screen, and then you say, okay, the lifetime of your uh, pump is. 10 years, mm-hmm. and then five years, two years, and then you can schedule the maintenance accordingly. Mm-hmm. And, and you're, you're doing the maintenance when it's needed. You can also propose an optimization of the use of the machine to increase the lifetime of your, uh, of your equipment. For example, for Carl, say, don't brake strongly, try to uh, drive in a smooth in a smoother way, right. and then you will uh, uh, you will uh, you you will have uh, more kilometer with your, your tires or oil or etc etc. And at the end, this is more money mm-hmm. because uh, using predictive maintenance, it has for oil and gas. This is where it has been implemented first, and uh, you can save twenty uh, percent uh, of the maintenance cost. Wow, that's a lot. Yeah, that's a lot. Yeah. That's a lot. And especially if it also increases the lifespan of the plant. Exactly, exactly. So, and then we are trying to uh, we are we are trying to implement this concept for nuclear. Mm-hmm. So the first uh, the first um, um, subsystem we worked on uh, it was um, it was it was called uh, a screen cleaners. Screen cleaners. So you know, in a, in a nuclear power plant, you have the the cooling system. Uh-huh. You, have to, uh, you so you have the river or the sea entering, and then cooling the, the nuclear power plant. Right. It's cool and then water. you have screen to uh, to uh, to make sure that uh, trees, vegetables, algae are not penetrating into the the cooling system. Right. And of course, you need sometimes you need to uh, to clean the screen. Mm-hmm. So this is why we have a mechanical system that is uh, removing the, the trees and the vegetables from the cooling system. It's a screen screen cleaners. It's a tongue twister. <laughs> <laughs>
<laughs> this is a name. I'm sorry. It's not. Uh, it's quite romantic name, no? It's screen cleaners. Screen cleaners. Uh, and of course, um, if the screen cleaners is tucked, mm -hmm. there is no more. There is not enough water entering into the cooling system, and then the temperature of the power plant raise, and then we have to stop the nuclear power plant. Right. So, so we have equipped. The, this mechanical uh, system with accelerator, mm -hmm. and uh, and then we are monitoring the status, and we are, every day we are sending report to the operator, where it, it is shown the status of the, the 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 way the system operates, if there is some defect anomaly, and then from the anomaly we are building some model. And then we are we are building the 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 mean time before failure of the of the system, and we are designing and proposing uh, a maintenance uh, inspection uh, um, according this uh, this uh, this uh, lifetime of the screen cleaners. Yeah. So this is and this is a real project that. Uh, we started one year ago, and then so now we have every morning we have the new data arriving, yeah. and then our engineers are checking the spectrum, the data, and then uh, they are proposing recommendation, and and then we are refining our model, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. So that's the first step of the project. Second step is to equip the pump. There is a yeah. lot of pump in nuclear, and then to uh, measure the and to monitor the vibration uh, spectrum of the pump. Why can't you measure the screen cleaner and the pump at the same time? We will, this is too, yeah, of course we can, we, uh, we, um, we, we, um, we will do that, we will do that. And, uh, but this is two different uh, assets mm -hmm. and the maintenance will be different mm -hmm. because the, the, the pump is just uh, a rotating machine and uh, pumping water, yeah. and then it, it's it's never simple. But uh, the, <laughs> no, no, the the you know the, the the main problem it's a mechanical problem the bearings the yeah. joints uh, you know, and then um, if you are if you are checking the the vibration spectrum, uh, you can have early signature of some some problems that will occur. So we are starting to do that. And for screen cleaners, this is just motion. Right. We are checking if the motion uh, is done uh, in, a, in, 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 a, in a proper manner or not. If there is vibration or if, uh, if the, the, the system uh, uh, did not put in a, in a right way or et cetera, et cetera. So, so you can... start on a simple component and then you gradually yeah, course, start measuring of course, others of course. until you have the whole system mapped out. And so then you can schedule the plant sort of yeah. over its lifetime for yeah. every five years we'll do all the pumps or every 10 years mm. we'll do all the screens. Yeah. What, what we have done also very interesting for the screen cleaners is we have coupled uh, external data. External by external data, I mean uh, tide level, ah. weather condition, and uh, the the season. Yeah. Because when you have a thunderstorm, you have more uh, materials than when the, the 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 sea is very calm. Right. When you have high tide, this is different. When you have low tide, mm -hmm. and and of course you can do some models. And perhaps in a couple of years we will we will get rid from the sensor because we will have we would have enough data and then we have the model and then we can use the virtual sensor. Right. That sounds amazing. Yeah. I really because, like that idea. Yeah. And it'd be cool to, you know, sort of predict when you're gonna have big storm surges, you yeah. know, hopefully you can not even on the scale yeah. of Fukushima, of what happened at Fukushima, but you can anticipate huge you can events anticipate, like that and yeah, sort of you can prepare anticipate, for it better. You can anticipate, yes. Yeah. So as we wrap up here, what do you see? Just, yeah. I, I just do you want, have one more? Yeah, one more. Go ahead. Dismantling. Yeah, go for it. Um, so dismantling, uh, 
when you do dismantling, that means you have to to get the memory. I, I was saying that before, hundred years before uh, ago. Mm-hmm. So you have to get lots of information, some, and you have to scan documents. Once you have scanned everything, you have to prepare the dismantling activities, and that means. For instance, we have done that for uh, an infrastructures for uh, the um, a research organization in France, which is called CEA, which is the organization developing the uh, the R and D uh, nuclear reactors. Mm-hmm. Uh, it was uh, the project was uh, having fourteen one four million of documents, so we have incorporated. <laughs> In a database is 14 million of documents. 14 million yeah, documents. One four. Yeah, one Yeah, That's amazing. Yeah, it's quite huge. It will take time for you and me to read that. Oh, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but AI and technology, they just you yeah. spit it in and uh, spit it out. Yeah. And what we have done, we have developed a search engine to, uh, to read the documents automatically and to answer to our experts' question. That hmm. means one expert is asking, I want to have the information of batiment B. And, and then it the scans syst- everything? The system is scanning everything. It said, okay, batiment B, building B, you have 50,000 uh, 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 documents. And then you can refine in a natural language. I want to have the number of uh, radioactive uh, 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 materials. And then the system is... Further refined yeah, within those further, And then saying, okay, if you want to dismantle that, you have uh, 10,000 containers. And, uh, uh, and, and then it gives you the type of containers. It gives you where you have to go, and uh, and then you can structure the teams, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. So it helps um, the the teams to organize, mm-hmm. and it also um, um, get. Uh, it's, it's also very important because you can minimize the provision for uh, um, hazards. Mm. Because if you don't have, if you don't, if you have not read the documents, sometimes. When you do the inspect, when you do the operation, you said, "Oh, this is a very dangerous uh, 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 zone right. that we were not uh, expecting." And then we stop uh, the dismantling process, and then we have to secure, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. Yeah. So here we are able to do the mapping of the all the infrastructures automatically, and then we organize um, uh, in a in a in in a better way, actually. Yeah, this so, is amazing. So. This is, you know, industry changing stuff. (laughs) But so in the like last minute that we have, just, I guess, to wrap up sort of all the new ideas that you've shared with me, what, you know, is your vision for the future of nuclear and the future technologies that will help push the industry forward? Yeah, I think that's for sure. uh, We have to do... uh, advanced system engineering to handle this complex project. And uh, the data will be important, model will be important, and uh, artificial intelligence will be important uh, because that will accelerate the way we, uh, we design and then we, we, we commission and we operate uh, the, the, the future nuclear power plant. That's first point. The second point is the the modular uh, uh, construction uh, is for me uh, crucial because it is another way to accelerate the design and the construction because you know you do m- a lot of things at manufacturing site mm-hmm. and then on on the project site you you will do only assembly and then commissioning, so that's very important. And as I said before, the generalization of the the predictive maintenance, but also optimization of the process to make sure that the safety will be ensured, 
the overall equipment efficiency will be maximum. Uh, that will sa that will save a lot of, of money and, and that will make the, the nuclear power plant more more safety. Wonderful. Which is what we want. Yeah, <laughs> which is what we hope for. <laughs> Dr. Robert Plana, thank okay. you so much. Thank you.